Welcome to Retro Fanfic Retrospective, the podcast where we dredge up old fanfiction and expose it to the cold, harsh light of 2019. My name is Amato, and with me are... Tori. And CJ. Yeah, Dom couldn't make it tonight. They're being juiced. That unfortunate <laughs> incident. It was quite horrifying. Yeah, we all bore witness. I feel traumatized. I mean, you should. It's I'm... very traumatizing. Personally, I only had to get fished out of a river of chocolate, which didn't seem fitting punishment for me. So Yeah, so if you were visiting Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory, what ironic fate would, you know, you meet on your way through? That's well, we have question. to identify which of the seven deadly sins we represent <laughs> first. Mm-hmm. Wait, how can they represent seven deadly sins? There's like five of them. Well, they represent five of the seven. Or four, because there's only four. Gladney. Uh, Gluttony. Envy. It's gluttony, pride, um, vanity. Is pride vanity and vanity one? can't be different sins, can they? I think they're different. Greed's got to be in there. Yeah. Greed. Well, uh, Mike TV was sloth because he would sit in front of the TV all day. Um, okay, but he's... This is my interpretation. I don't know. I was just thinking about this the other day. Uh, Violet Beauregard would have been pride. That's one of the sins. Mm-hmm. And then, right, because she wants to win everything. Right. Mm-hmm. And then... Um, Veruca Salt. Veruca Salt, I thought, was vanity, but maybe that's not one of the seven deadly <laughs> sins, so maybe I'm wrong. Maybe Google should save us here. Yeah. I think... I feel like the seven deadly sins get, you know, have had a few incarnations, like, it's kind of like the yeah. elements. According to the standard list, they are pride... Greed, lust, envy, gluttony, wrath, and sloth. She must be greed because mm-hmm. her whole thing yes. is she wants the golden egg. Mm-hmm. Right? Pride, greed, or and in this gluttony. Case, I'm squirrel? there with you for a golden nut. <laughs> huh? I'm sorry. Uh, whatever. So pride, greed, and gluttony makes sense to me. I don't know about Mike TV being sloth. Like well, he kind of jumps right in there. He's pretty prideful too. Yeah, yeah. Sort I know. Of. Or See, that was the only thing I could think envy? of. Because, well, but the whole thing that they make out with his character is that he's obsessed with television. Right. So that that was my natural jump from, like, the time period the story was written and what television represented was that he'd sit in front of the TV instead of being, like, productive. Mm -hmm. So that that was maybe a leap in logic. But if you had to find one, I feel like that was the one that would make sense personally. Hmm. Probably. I'm glad we didn't have that lust kid there in the, you know... (laughs) That was cut. In the mix, right? That was Willy Wonka. PG. An earlier draft. <laughs> <laughs> that was all the uh, fangirls of Willy Wonka in this fanfiction. I would, however, be down for some, like, little kid representing Wrath, just, like, smashing their way through. It's like, oh, I want to break that tree <laughs> that's, like, made out of sponge sugar. Just I want to see it come down. Attacking things. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there'd be a lot of satisfaction, like, rampaging across that landscaped first room, right? I hate this stupid factory. I hate these stupid Oompa Loompas. <laughs> uh, Too much chaos. We are reading a Willy... Uh, not Willy Wonka. Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory is only the older movie. A Charlie and the Chocolate Factory slash CSI fanfic tonight. And like the last time you were on, CJ... Mm-hmm. I don't think I... I might have found a recommendation for this. But mostly it's just when I saw the premise, I couldn't not do it. Like, right? same with the Narnia and uh, Labyrinth <laughs> crossover. It's just too good. Uh, Death too by good chocolate? Too good a premise. Yeah. Right. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> totally. And it actually is a Death by Chocolate. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. It's a quite literal title. I want to say outright... I actually really enjoyed this. <laughs> I read it I've pretty got a quickly. I've few complaints, yeah. but yeah. they, but I, I'm still just sold on the whole project from the word go. Mm-hmm. I I really I'm coming from the opposite perspective of I was not sold on this. I figured <laughs> there's no way they could make this work. This will be ridiculous. It's just the author's like pet fandoms that don't mash together, and it's true that it is, and yet they made it work. So that's really impressive. Well, before we talk about the fanfic itself, I guess we back up and talk about our experience with the source material, right? Mm -hmm. So did either of you watch CSI regularly? I did a bit when I was younger. It was the only CSI 
I think that I watched was Las Vegas. This one was just called CSI originally, right? Yeah. It's the first one. It's the CSI. Yeah. I feel like I saw the absolute minimum CSI that anyone possibly could, which is like two episodes, right? I feel like you can't get away with seeing less than that. Maybe. As a human being in America. Are you you sure? (laughs) Have you seen Zero? No. Do you um, know anybody who has seen Zero? I've never really polled the people I know to figure out how much CSI they've seen. So there you go. Yeah, I haven't collected the CSI data. (laughs) (laughs) So yeah, this wasn't one of my particular shows I liked, but it's funny because I used to watch TV with my folks a lot. And this was one I remember my folks watching with my brother. Maybe it didn't come out until after, like, I stopped watching TV with them or something. I don't remember when CSI came out. That's true. This was a family show. In our yeah. house. Oh, the, those two episodes that I probably watched, definitely at my grandma's house, where, like, the TV was on a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Do y'all remember what when CSI first came out? The internet remembers. Yeah. According to the internet, uh, 2000. Oh, okay. So, I think... And they had 15 seasons. Yeah. I think Holy it was cow. maybe I'm, one oh of God. the... The newer seasons of CSI, my family watched a lot. There was, like, a goth girl who did all the lab work. That's what I remember. Anyway, um, I watched some of that with them, but I don't recognize the characters from from this one. Yeah, me neither. I was just rolling with, like, okay, here's these characters. I know their names now because they've been introduced to me in this fanfic. I had, like, distant recollections as I was reading them. I was like, all right, Grissom's kind of, like, sort of antisocial, but kind of brilliant. And he's like the lead detective. He's or like whatever the Sherlock he is. Holmes guy. Yeah, he's kind yeah. of a Sherlock Holmesy kind of guy. And Supervisor, then, forensic investigator, apparently supervising right. whatever. Right. And uh, Catherine, he has some kind of like sexual tension with this Catherine person, <laughs> but he's too awkward to do anything about it. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, the others are just kind of copy kind of guys. And then there's some lab people that are kind of fun. Yeah. That's what I remember. So to me, it's very possible I never saw an episode of this original CSI. I probably saw one of the spinoffs, but... I mean, it was enough uh, to get us through here because it's not... I, I mean, I'm sure CSI fans would probably disagree, but like, it's not about the characters as a right. main point. Right. What the author does a good job of is giving the characters their character beats really succinctly in the opening, so you kind of just know what sort of archetypes are supposed to be. And that really, I think, carries you through the story, like, if you're like me and didn't know these characters. I, I agree. I didn't feel like I needed to, like, go and rewatch an episode of CSI to get a grip on mm-hmm. you know, what was going on. So I yeah. pulled up, like, yeah. a picture, so I saw, like, Grissom, and I was like, oh, yeah, that guy looks familiar. Yes, right. I did that, too. <laughs> <laughs> See? Lower left. Is White that, hair, glasses. Is that the guy? Um, oh, no, that's uh, Grissom. Isn't that is the guy, guy from. Um, oh, Grissom. oh, well, then I had the wrong picture in my head and I was thinking of another CSI. Isn't that so the there you go. guy from the I think, the it, good think it's place? the same CSI. Yes, Angel? I think you're right. That's but what I recognize him from. That's a different CSI, isn't it? It's the same CSI. Well, it's the I think same he. It's CSI he came on later. Yeah. I think that's why I'm confused here. Yes. <laughs> but yeah, he is in uh, the good place. Mm. Okay. Well, what about the Roald Doll? side charlie and the chocolate factory were you a fan huge fan as a kid Mm -hmm. read the book saw willy wonka obviously many times and i saw the charlie and the chocolate factory film with johnny depp one time i'm in the exact same boat like love roald doll books definitely saw willy wonka more than once definitely saw charlie and the chocolate factory with johnny depp only once yes <laughs> and i have not seen the newest version of charlie and the chocolate factory which i found out about what? doing research for this podcast what? there's a new yeah, one yeah somehow it didn't get that much attention it's tom yeah. and jerry charlie and the chocolate factory yeah it's true it's pretty much exactly the same except tom and jerry are running around in the background sometimes so what do they represent? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, we got our wrath right there. Wrath, yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> we might have our wrath and our lust. I don't remember what Jerry's has Jerry's going on. taunts Tom a lot. I feel like that's his character flaw. Is he does things deliberately to provoke him. So I, I don't know what Sid that is, but... Um, we'll call him Puck. <laughs> <laughs> the Sin of Puck. Yeah. So anyway. Yeah, seriously, Puck a couple of years ago, there was a Tom and Jerry animated adaptation of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, and they're like... 
the house pets of the buckets or something. I don't know. That's that, amazing. Yeah. It's ridiculous. <laughs> I, why would you do that? There's like no overlap in concept or execution that well, you could possibly have in those two things. This is when you have to ask yourself, why not do that? Why not do that? Well, look, when you had Care Bears, the Nutcracker, they were like participating. But like Tom and Jerry are not kids with the golden ticket. They're not like part of the story. Glancing on like the Wikipedia synopsis of it or whatever. Actually, it was the Charlie and the Chocolate Factory wiki synopsis. It seems like they just don't matter to the plot. I, I well, think it's sort of like the um, wishbone principle. Like, these mm. are characters designed to take us to a story. Like, wishbone the dog. You right, know? Yes, we except that the they dog. are definitely not designed to do that, unlike wishbone the dog. Right, wishbone does participate. But what I'm saying is it's like, this is a window into a different story from yeah, something popular. I get it. However, I don't think it works very well because how popular are Tom and Jerry nowadays? I feel like Charlie and the Chocolate Factory is actually more popular. Uh, that's probably like, true. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Anyway. Now, I'm all bad-mouthing this without having seen it. Maybe it's amazing. Maybe it's, like, such a good adaptation. Mm-hmm. Probably not. But anyway, Tori, uh, yeah. similar background with Charlie? A little bit different. Um, loved the the Willy Wonka movie growing up, of course. <laughs> who doesn't? Uh, who I, I don't know if I loved it. I just saw it a few times. Ah. Like... Hmm. I think I liked it, but it's also not the most settling movie to watch, no. you know? It's a little unsettling. I think that's why I was drawn to it, is because it had a particular appeal of unsettlingness that, like, as a kid, you're like, you know, there are things about this that are fun and fantastical, but there are things about this that are really creepy, and I don't really know why. Yeah. You know, like, I don't know why it bothers like, me. Like, surely they does. wouldn't be showing this to me if it wasn't... Right. I think I think I had some kind of like catharsis watching it because I was bullied a lot as a kid. Mm-hmm. Ah. So watching all the bad kids mm. get their comeuppance. There's definitely yeah. that. Nice. I just wasn't sure why I was supposed to like Willy Wonka if I was supposed to like Willy Wonka as a figure mm. because he seems to delight in punishing these children and that seemed very like alien to me. But my parents really liked. My parents both went to Catholic school, so I can kind of see how they might uh. I, I, I don't know. In my mind, it's like, I, I can see how they'd see this adult figure punishing children in a certain way that actually made sense. <laughs> it's kind of a relatable figure. To me, it wasn't. However, I, I really liked it. It was pretty delightful. And the book was also delightful. I loved the Roald Doll stories. They always had the same sort of appeal. And actually, when I saw the Johnny Depp Charlie and Chocolate Factory, I was, I, I was like maybe, what, 15 or 16 when that came out? I actually loved that because I was really obsessed with Johnny Depp at the time. <laughs> and I saw it in the um, Omnimax theater, which is like the IMAX. It's like a giant screen that you have to lay back mm-hmm. and like see everything. It was really disorienting and dizzying. <laughs> and I actually felt like nauseous partway through. But I felt like the movie, I remember having a quote from the movie on my MySpace page because I thought it was like so humorous and funny. <laughs> Well, there you go. Yeah, I don't know. I'm a couple years younger than you guys. Maybe it hit me at that right time. From what I remember, I don't know if I was sold on the Willy Wonka backstory, but I think the performance was good. Like, the book Willy Wonka and the Willy Wonka movie Willy Wonka and the Charlie and the Chocolate Factory Willy Wonka are all very different. Mm -hmm. But the way the Johnny Depp movie played him seemed like a very reasonable, strong, and interesting to watch way to play this guy who is just... 100% 100% obsessed with candy. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I thought it was... <laughs> Nothing else matters. It's right. amazing. <laughs> it was charming in that way of being super absurd. Like, right. it's the mm-hmm. sort of character, you know... This is around the same time I started watching this show as, like, House MD. Like, characters that you should not like, but have a certain charm. Mm-hmm. And his charm was very absurd. And, and the, so... the quotes he put out were just, like... The one I had in my MySpace was, like, everything... Someone could ask them if something is... Ed- edible or eatable he's like everything in this room is eatable even i'm eatable <laughs> and it goes on to some like weird place but it's like technically you can eat everything including me and you're just like that is the weirdest thing to say to a kid but like that's where he's coming from mentally yeah. right yeah it's great yeah. all right ready to start talking about the fanfic itself mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so this story is titled csi death by chocolate it is by beth I'm not sure how to say their last name. Ein 
Ains, Ains Panier. E-I-N-S-P-A-N-I-E-R. Huh. You just had a French class earlier today, CJ. I Is mean, that a French name? I'm not sure. I would either go with Ein Spanier or Ein Spanier. Ein Spanier. If it's they're, probably, it looks, you know, an English speaker, they probably pronounce it in more more of an Anglophone kind of way. All right. Yeah. Beth Ein Spanier. And again, it's a CSI original and Charlie and the Chocolate Factory crossover. It came out in 2005, which puts it right up on the edge of what I'm willing to do on this show. And it wasn't finished until 2006 even. I feel like we've done one other fanfic that was that late, and I think it was um, the Avatar fanfic, maybe? Mm-hmm. And in that case, it was because... It was 2006 was the Avatar yeah. fanfic. And in that case, it was because that's about as early as you could get good Avatar fanfiction, mm-hmm. and we kind of wanted to do it. In this case, it's just because I kind of wanted to do it, period. Uh, you can find a link to the story. We have a link to the fanfiction.net copy at bit.ly slash rfrchocolate. And, yeah, it's, it looks like it was originally published on fanfiction.net, and probably only there. Did either of you check out the, like, someone reading it out loud on YouTube? There's someone reading it out loud on YouTube? Apparently at least the first three chapters. I sent that in the text message to you, but... I did not, just because yeah. I was trying to get through it and uh, playing a YouTube video on your phone in the car while you're driving doesn't work very well because you if you turn off the screen the youtube video quits out so i didn't check it out but yeah, same here i read it on the bus so yeah oh well it, it would be interesting I, I i had a temptation to i just didn't quite have time mm-hmm. i must have missed it no, no worries the author mentions it like author's note first page nice <laughs> yeah. i just went straight into it i was like i only have so much time yeah. <laughs> to read. well speaking of going straight into it The story opens, chapter one, on the dead body of Charlie Bucket. That's where we are, square one. No. (laughs) It's so sad. Yeah. On the one hand, it's sad. On the other hand, it's... I kind of appreciate that it's like, that's where they started. There was no prologue. There's no flashbacks. Charlie's dead to begin with the whole time. And that's how a CSI episode might start, right? Mm -hmm. I was going to say, like, if you take this as a CSI episode, which I think the structure makes you take it as, it doesn't feel like as much weight you know like uh the characters appear and they're sort of absurd and charlie's dead but you don't you're like oh but this is a csi episode and that allows you to kind of take the emotional impact of that away a little bit i guess right oh and it's 10 years post um charlie and the chocolate factory specifically 10 years post the johnny depp movie Mm -hmm. which is necessary to put it in the modern day Mm -hmm. uh Okay. Even It seems like the author liked that movie, but even if they hadn't, you couldn't cross over CSI Las Vegas and the original book or the f- original movie. Exactly. Of course. Because Charlie would be dead by natural causes, probably, <laughs> or like chocolate I mean, heart attack. Because <laughs> you have a much older Charlie, but... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and they, they did specifically mention in their disclaimer, which is funny, they mentioned their disclaimer that they wish the characters were mine, though after seeing the recent Johnny Depp movie, I wish Wonka was mine. Oh, yeah, it's the normal Which fan is... fiction disclaimer. None of this belongs to me, but yeah. I wish Wonka was mine. I, I don't agree. Like, yeah. Johnny Depp, sure. Johnny Depp yeah. playing Willy Wonka? Um, yeah, very bizarre. That is like, not an appealing partner, I no. gotta say. He's very, like, yeah, no, I don't, I don't get that, like... I, I do get why... Pe- you're right. I get why people are attracted to Johnny Depp. Like, he could be attractive, sure. But that character was really creepy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and definitely not interested in relationships at mm-hmm. all. <laughs> so starting starting off this fanfic, right, it's, it's Nick and Grissom, like, you know, doing the initial analysis. And I like how they really undermine any sense of, you know right pathos that might be about charlie being dead with like the very first thing being like that there's you know traces of brown stuff all over him and they're like i hope that's not what we think it is because they think it's crap (laughs) yeah and obviously it's chocolate yeah (laughs) but that also seemed like csi kind of dark humor also yeah the yeah the kind of quips that keep it light even Even though it's all about people being murdered right and they like roll their eyes they're like ah vegas (laughs) yeah (laughs) <laughs> That's kind of how crime shows go. So I feel like even though I hadn't seen that much CSI, I kind of got the crime show vibe. And so the first couple chapters is about them 
the team just kind of getting their basic information, like he appears to have been drowned in chocolate and also beamed on the back of the head by something round. Which, which they assume is a billiard ball. But fairly soon they like analyze the traces and it's a gobstopper. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> of course. <laughs> um the body was dumped, like in the what is it, like the Vegas desert. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Somewhere in the desert. Yeah, they, but they find like an ID to identify who he is. And you know, also like a scrap of a a news article about a new Willy Wonka uh what would you call it? Candy store location Candy store emporium opening thing. in Las Vegas, which yeah. is a big deal because they haven't opened one outside of England in like 30 years, apparently. Mm-hmm. Now, I think so, ever, right? Uh, I think they, they said s- 30 years. Oh, right. right. It's part okay. of the backstory that like Willy Wonka kind of withdrew, at least in the, in the Johnny I Depp see. movie. Um, out of fear of, like, because competitors were trying to steal his secrets, and so, like, he brought it all in, or he went traveling, and, like, he recruited the Oompa Loompas and mm-hmm. went back and kind of started up operations again mysteriously, but, like, was not seen in public any much anymore. So it kind of jives that, like, re-expanding would be a, a plot thread that could continue from the end of the movie. Mm-hmm. In 30 years, though, would imply that Willy Wonka is, like, at least 50, which the Johnny Depp character does not seem to indicate. In the, um, well, that would mean, according to this fanfic in the film, he'd be 40. Well, if he hadn't opened a new store in 30 years... Right, in, he would have had to have He would have had to have been at least, yeah. like, Candy you know, an adult, right, is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> <laughs> like, he mentions, at one point, this fanfic and conversation comes up. It's like, oh, yeah, I was traveling through Germany, like, back when I was, like, 19 or whatever. And, like, their chocolate's pretty good, but I figured I could do better. And, you know, just in, like, a rant about chocolate... Mm-hmm. So like maybe he's maybe he's just a like ageless, well preserved yeah. fifty who like you know his skin is untouched by the sun and therefore not like. I think of him as kind of a creepy candy loving Peter Pan a little bit. Yeah, well, I think that's, that's a fair true. read. Well, yeah, because he is supposed to be childish in nature, so I guess childish in appearance as well. Now, when we're mentioning kind of some of this initial information, I I'm not that experienced with CSI, right? And so coming into this, I was reading it like it was a murder mystery and thinking that like, oh, these details of like how he was killed or, you know, beamed in the back of the head or like how he was drowned or like th- why his his ID was in the state that it was, that like those details would be contributing to a, you know, final explanation of how the crime was committed exactly. Yeah, I and thought it, that too. But it's not, I had to remind myself later on, it's not a murder mystery, it's a procedural Mm-hmm. And that's a different yeah. genre, and so none of that really matters. But then, in why the story. include all of those details if they're not relevant? I mean, that being said, I I feel, and I can't say for certain because I'm not an expert either. But I feel that most CSI episodes would, you know, give details like here's what we think happened. Mm-hmm. But yeah, that didn't really occur in this like and at all. I feel like maybe it's just a symptom of bad planning. Because the author notes later on are like, oh, yeah, I, like my muse had left me, but I'm like, I, I, I knocked out this scene or whatever. It seemed like they did not have it planned from square one. Yeah. The thing is, is the opening is really strong, like mm-hmm. in terms of all the clues that are given. Like it is. You just those clues don't matter. Right. right. It's just that the, the ending to me felt rushed. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. I really had a hard time believing the ending of the story. I agree. I was kind of hoping... Because, you know, they're bringing all these characters back in that it would be kind of like a murder on the Orient Express sort of yeah. mm-hmm. situation. Not to get ahead of myself, you know. I would have been more into it if that was the structure. And they start building that up with like, oh, here's a suspect and they're an obvious suspect. But here's another pop person who might be a suspect. Mm-hmm. And then here's a third person who enters the picture. And, and then it doesn't really follow through on that. But no. I guess we'll get to that a little bit later. Well, what the author does... You know, just to kind of sum it up a little, is they bring in all the other golden ticket winners. Kind no, of not Augustus Gloop. Oh, except for Augustus Gloop, yeah. <laughs> they bring in three. He's on the straight and narrow. Yeah. <laughs> they mention him, I think. Yes. Yeah. 
But they bring in all of them, and it seemed like really fun for the author to explore them now that they're all, I guess, uh, in their 20s. Um, Charlie Bucket was 22. Yeah, so. 10 years they're, later. They were all later, older so. than 10, so they're all adults now, right? I didn't realize they were older than 10. I thought they were younger, but... Well, they were all older than eight. Yeah, whatever. Anyway. <laughs> Everyone had nebulous ages. Yeah. <laughs> they can all be older than eight, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anyway, point being... They get to bring all those characters in and kind of investigate them as this story goes on. Except yeah. for Augustus Gloop, I guess the author didn't have interest in him. Now, we probably um, don't have to talk about it in terms of, like, the order that events go. But we can talk about a few different threads. So, for example, if we're on the topic of the Golden Ticket winners, we can talk about the other ones, that, like, and how they kind of, the roles they play mm-hmm. in the story. Mm-hmm. Um, I think Verica Salt comes on screen first. She, like, like happens to have been in the hotel room next to Charlie Bucket, and that is, like, a suspicious plot thread thing that is kind of resolved later on. Right, because they find, uh, like, dyed blonde hair on the victim and, mm. and uh, animal hair as well, which they narrow down to be, like, mink. Yeah. Yeah, yeah which she wears. Yeah. They ask her, do you own any mink coats? She's like, five. <laughs> Are they real mink? Of course. <laughs> You're going to spray paint them? <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what she says. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, she's now kind of in charge of the salt nut empire or whatever. Um, actually, right. She also becomes relevant when they go to investigate the location of the opening, you know, new opening Willy Wonka store. I forget who goes exactly, but they find they find a bunch of Oompa Loompas who initially pelt them with candy. There's like 20 of them there in Vegas who are going to be like operating, I guess, I guess making candy in the store because you can't really ship Wonka goods, I guess. Right. Well, I, later Wonka says that he he shipped liquid chocolate because that's the only way to make good chocolate. Yeah, specifically well, he said he shipped a um, chocolate uh, uh, waterfall. Miniature waterfall. Yeah. waterfall. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. He could have shipped the whole waterfall, so the miniature waterfall. And that was quite tricky. So but yeah. who, who, and so, who can make that chocolate taste good but his Oompa Loompas so. right mm-hmm. on so, assignment like, there's the scene of them like you know the, the Oompa Loompas break out into song which is great and describe what they saw and that like Verica Salt had an argument with Charlie and like that's who you know they're accusing and the fact they break out into song is great the fact that it's 20 Oompa Loompas and it's Charlie and the Chocolate Factory movie Oompa Loompas so they all look exactly the same yeah so one of the <laughs> one of the pleasures of this fanfic is the the colliding of the assumptions of the two, you know, works. And so, you know, in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, it's just like, okay, like, that's weird, but whatever. And the oh, the CSI characters in multiple ways are kind of forced to do that. It's like, this is completely bizarre and ridiculous, but we are following procedure and we're going to bring them in and, like, get their testimony. Right? So, yeah. Of, yeah. Of these 20 Oompa Loompas. <laughs> Which leads to the delightful interrogation room scene where they're all, yeah. like, brought in and <laughs> in line. Interrogated separately. The, the, the police people have trouble keeping them straight. Mm-hmm. Even though they all have completely separate names and, like, you know, are clearly identifiable to each other. Mm-hmm. Yeah, at, at this point, like, various members of the team are going different places. Like, some people are going to England, some people are going to the candy factory. Right. Grissom gets a call from the people at the candy factory who have found the Oompa Loompas, and he's like, I don't have time for this prank. We're doing a murder investigation. Like, what mm-hmm. the heck? Right. And there's also a call from the lab saying that, <laughs> the, I don't know, some it, sort of candy it, firework it, event happened. Well, I yeah. thought that was pretty great because it was understated. Mm-hmm. It's the sample of the everlasting lasting gobstopper that when they ran it through the ma- mass analysis, whatever it's called, machine, basically just went totally apeshit crazy. It just exploded. <laughs> because it has infinite mass. I was like, yes, that's so great. <laughs> the mass spectrometer. Because the so everlasting so. lasting gobstopper, just you can suck on it forever, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So Grissom is like, come on, you guys, stop playing this elaborate prank. And he really doesn't believe anything until he sees the 20 Oompa Loompas at the police station giving separate statements. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. It should be noted that one of the lab people, Greg, is really into Wonka lore. Yes. Oh, yes. And he kind of knows, what's, you know, the backstory before everybody else does of, you know, the, the tour and the five golden tickets and all that sort There's of thing. a conversation between him. Wow, what's that guy's name? Uh, he's important. I just don't. 
Is it... It's not Greg. Greg is the, the lab person, right? Grissom is the main guy. No, There's that is Greg. Other... Greg. Greg is the guy. Mm-hmm. And so... Um, yeah, Greg's the one who like is a Willy Wonka fan, mm-hmm. yes. and it's like, how do you not? How are you not following the golden ticket thing as a kid? And Grissom's just like, I'm not really into chocolate, and whatever. <laughs> also, like he's much older because if the kids are only like 22, oh, it was right. only 10 years ago. So anyway. but he's also like, how are you not familiar with Willy Wonka? It's the best candy chocolate in the world. And Grissom's like, eh, whatever. Yeah, yeah, because I guess uh, Greg is must be pretty young then. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's he's one of the younger cast. And so <laughs> Greg's also the one who's sent to follow up on another lead to mm-hmm. um, to interview, what's her name? Um, Violet, Violet Beauregard. Violet Beauregard. Be- Beauregard. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's another, he eventually gets in. There's, there's some funny scenes. She's performing at Cirque du Soleil. She's a, like, <laughs> world-class top Acrobat. acrobat, yeah, acrobat slash, slash contortionist. Contortionist, right? They, yeah, they mostly say acrobat. I think, but. And yeah, I think at some point um, it says, you know, acrobat isn't or, uh, contortionist isn't right because to contort means to be in pain, which she clearly uh, wasn't in pain. That's an interesting way to put it, I guess. Yeah, I guess. I I like the scene where he's trying to like knock at her dressing room door, and like there's a what do you call it, bouncer, guard, like, outside. Yeah. And, you know, he knocks on the door, and it's like, oh, the police are here to see you, says the guard person, even though he's not technically police. And her response is, is he cute? And then there's this beat where the guard, like, completely seriously, like, looks him over, judging this. <laughs> and he's like, eh, I guess. He kind of looks, looks like lo- Tony Hawk. Yeah. <laughs> That's what he said. Which is like, such a weirdly on. specific description. <laughs> That's what I makes it. He's got skater aesthetic. Like I don't know what the character actually looks like. So he's, well, th- that's he's what makes the scene funny. It's like blonde frosted tips and. Okay, but like that's not what Tony Hawk looks like. I know. <laughs> that's what makes the scene funny is that the guards' feedback is specific. Yeah, and yeah. she's like, "Send him in." And yeah, they have a scene. They also get to flirt. Not, it doesn't matter. It's an absent plot thread. Mm-hmm. But like that's it's another example yeah. of the the clashing assumptions where like she is blue forever because of her Willy Wonka incident mm-hmm. and she's like oh but, th- but that's fine you know yeah. and that's that's more like from the Willy Wonka you know like that's what yeah. Roald Dahl would say is like yeah she was blue forever and she became a like right. top class acrobat and like was it lived happily insane. ever right. after yeah. <laughs> yeah it's the you know it's a very um gritty crime drama kind of thing clashing with absurdism which is very whimsical however what it does very well i think is point to the fact that crime dramas are pretty absurd in of themselves Mm. because they oftentimes establish you know these uh, criminal cases that are really overblown and like the leads end up in, in really strange things such as when they first say oh he was drowned in chocolate it's like yeah, you could imagine somebody doing that in CSI. It's like a lead-in, right? Yeah. Like, how did that happen? It's like, no, that's not that real. That doesn't happen, right. But in Willy Wonka's world, why not? So, uh, yeah, I love these clashes. They're really good. Well, I have something more to say about that in regards to the end of the fanfic, but we'll get there. Mm-hmm. Uh, but at these times, that's definitely part of the pleasure. It's just the CSI people being faced with this completely off-the-wall bonkers stuff and just having to accept it because... You have to accept it in because order to move a, forward. Yeah, they're in a CSI episode. Right, yeah. <laughs> so they're like, we can't say it's weird because, come they, on. They, they can't just like, be like, I'm done. Like, yeah. I know. <laughs> well, because, you know. There's some CS- tries a couple times. Home. He yeah. thinks about it. <laughs> in a CSI episode, they probably would get faced with some weird shit. It just wouldn't be magic, which it right. ends up being. Right. right. But we kind of get a slow build up to them realizing it actually is magic, which is pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Violet's basically a dead end. Like, nothing comes of that. Even Nothing comes of the flirting, either. Um, but, yeah, she apparently she also got extra flexible after being juiced and also a better attitude. She's like, yeah, you know how you juice a lemon and all, like, the citrus comes out? I think when they juiced me back then, like, they got some of that kind of, like, citrusy, you know, elements of my personality out. And since then, I've been kind of a chiller person. <laughs> but still also, like, super competitive still, of course. Right. Yeah. And so it's like, sure, why not? Why not? <laughs> Violet. <laughs> why not? Why not? Giving well, us some closure for Violet. Yeah, they, they 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 did a good job of kind of creating adult versions of the characters that weren't just like 
the shitty archetypes of children they were. Mm-hmm. It's like, you I know, mean, people they, grow up. they were kids that they grow up. It's just, they also gave a magical explanation for Violet becoming a better person, which I thought was extremely funny. It's like, <laughs> I didn't learn from my mistakes. I just got juiced. Right. <laughs> like, it's which is what she says. I got juiced. Um, now, another... So the next, like, major, major thing that happens that I want to talk about is that a couple of them go to England to interview Willy Wonka, Mm -hmm. which is necessary because he never, ever, ever leaves his factory ever, period. And never has visitors. Right. And uh, who are the two who go? Uh, Grissom and Catherine. Grissom and Catherine, okay. Which probably would mean something to people who cared about that ship and doesn't mean anything Um, to me. Yeah. Which... I could also be wrong about. I'm not going to, like, stake my reputation on that, but I'm. I, that's what I remember. All I have from this fanfic is that Grissom and Catherine are around the same age, and mm-hmm. they're a man and a woman who work together mm-hmm. in a TV show, so they probably had some sort of romantic yes. implications there. But also, yeah. she's a mom, so I don't know if that means she's married, but... Yeah, I don't know anything don't about remember. the character. Yeah. No. They say in this that she's a mom, so... Mm-hmm. So... Yeah, they managed to get in by, I mean, it's nothing clever. Like, they, they, the London investigators act like it's clever, that, like, they managed to get in. But it's not, because basically, he just gets on the phone with Doris, mm-hmm. who is the secretary, who stonewalls anyone who tries him to see Wonka. That's, like, her job. That's, mm-hmm. you know, basically probably what she does all day. April Ludgating it the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then, but then when Grissom, you know drops the fact that, oh, and the, the factory in that was being set up in Las Vegas has been firebombed. And somehow that information hasn't reached them yet. Yeah, we forgot to mention that. The, the thing, it, it gets blown up. It does. It gets yeah. blown yeah, up. Yeah, that happens. Did we not mention that? We didn't mention that. But it, that happens, too, later on. You know, after oh, it's like after they went and got all the Oompa Loompas out. They, right. They got bombed. They got yeah. blown yes. up. It actually happened pretty quickly, I guess. Mm-hmm. And so when Grissom drops that, she's like, well, what the hell? And, like, basically, like, Wonka needs to talk to somebody about that. And mm-hmm. so I guess it's them. And so they get let in for an interview. And only the two of them, not the guy from Scotland Yard. No, who needs people from Scotland Yard? Nobody. They just need to turn to Sherlock Holmes to get anything done. Yeah. <laughs> Even in the modern day, there's probably some modern day set Sherlock Holmes, right? Like, it going on at any given time. Exactly. Hmm. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so they do eventually get in to see Willy Wonka in the factory. They do. And it's, it's kind of rough that they have to tell him that Charlie was murdered. Mm-hmm. It's, I think, I mean, exactly what you would expect his reaction to be. It's very humanizing for the whole story. And it's exactly the part I was dreading the whole time. Well, the mm-hmm. author apologizes at the start of that chapter. They're like, yeah, sorry, we had to tell him sometime. Yeah, it made me really sad. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's very sad. Because um, they, they, you know, they... they they say, like, do you know Mr. Wonka? Do you know Charlie Bucket? And he's like, oh, yeah, like, you know, he's, he's a wonderful child, like, wonderful kid, and, like, you know, my apprentice, and I sent him off to, to Las Vegas for such and such and such, and, like, they kind of cut him off yeah. and, like, show him a picture. He was discovered several days ago in the Nevada desert a few miles outside of Las Vegas, and they show <laughs> him the picture. And the line is, and this is the paragraph, the chocolatier frowned. That's really not a very good picture of Charlie. Why, he looks almost... Di- he broke off suddenly. He looked at Catherine, and deep in those vi- vibrant violet eyes, she saw his world crumble. It was like watching a high-rise building explode, a common enough occurrence in Las Vegas. I see, he said in a very small voice. That's... that's very sad. I... His voice broke. His lips started to quiver, and his eyes filled and overflowed. His knees wobbled, and the two CSIs each took an arm and guided him to a seat on the cold linoleum, where he wept like a child. Yeah. It's like, dang. Mm -hmm. It's kind of when you first read the opening, and it's like a CSI opening, and you're like, oh, Charlie Bucket's dead, okay. (laughs) Ha ha, it's like a CSI, like, Charlie and Chocolate Factory crossover. You're like, this is kind of silly, Mm -hmm. in a way. But you kind of, like, at least for me, I kind of was like, but actually, like, wow, how upsetting is that, that Charlie Bucket's dead? Yeah. And this is where you get that actual feeling. And the author does not hold back with it. No, and I mean, this is this is Willy Wonka as a character, right? So he's not close to anybody except probably Charlie. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And he's his entire vision for the future and, like, idea of his legacy is tied in on this one guy succeeding him. Mm-hmm. Yep. 
like and so that is really just like his whole future and life you know kind of getting destroyed there right not just someone that he cares about but also his own future aspirations for his his factory and everything right and like you you can hardly even see him backing up and trying to find a successor again right like yeah well he even says he's like i'm too old to do that again yeah i'm not i'm not doing that again (laughs) (laughs) and there's another humanizing moment when um you know grissom keeps talking about what happened when the emporium or whatever in las vegas blew up and uh Wonka has a moment where he's like, oh, the Oompa Loompas, you know? Oh, yeah. And and he's like, they're all fine. And he lists off the names. <laughs> yeah, every single one of them. <laughs> There's like 20. <laughs> and, and only after the 20th name, and like Willy Wonka's clear, like checking them off in a mental checklist, mm-hmm. like only after he confirms that all of them are okay, is this like, he relax them a bit. Right. <laughs> which is sweet. But it's also humanizing because, yeah. Yeah, he cares about the Oompa Loompas, which is not really something you get i think from charlie and the chocolate factory as much like you know that there's the only people he hangs out with right mm-hmm. but you don't necessarily get how much he cares about them which it's I, not conveyed like, well you know he should but it's right. not given to you in the source and it is here yeah you like, don't expect him to know them all by name yeah it's nice in here at least that he does like they're almost you know slave labor for his factory like it, it but this implies that he has a good relationship with them and mm-hmm. he's not you know evil <laughs> right like he could be evil you you really get the impression he could just be not a good guy i think that willy wonka portrayal and humanization is actually a particularly strong point of this fanfic yeah. And I mean, it's probably something the author was interested in doing because clearly they're a fan of Johnny Depp, Willy Wonka. Mm-hmm. But like, for example, you know, his next response after like weeping is like he bounces back into kind of more of a manic mode. And he's like, you know, uh, Catherine was kind of comforting him physically and like he backs off and like he replaces his gloves and like he starts babbling about how like, oh, you know, Charlie was going to help me with all these things. We were trying to develop a new type of cinnamon candy that we breathe fireballs and, you know, such and such and such, and, like, Charlie this and Charlie that. And, you know, he's, he came up with 35 flavors of new taffy and, like, all these things. Oh, I can, here's a quote. Oh, I can tell you that Jelly Belly raised this bit of a stink about that, but there wasn't really anything they could do because we came up with buttered toast flavored before they did. And, you know, throughout this, Grissom's trying to interject, like, Mr. Wonka, Mr. Wonka, <laughs> trying to get his attention. And I like how that scene ended because I could really picture... I could really picture it acted by, you know, Johnny Depp, Willy Wonka. He finally gets his attention and he says, I need to ask you a few questions that might help us find out who killed Charlie. Wonka quieted immediately, appearing to search for a compromise between extreme high and extreme low. He settled on polite helpfulness and offered the investigators a queasy smile, but appeared not to have the heart left to make it dazzle as before. And I can just see that, like, kind of formal smile in that performance. Mm-hmm. You know, it's funny you bring that up though, because for me, the whole time I was reading this, you know, I glossed the part where it was the author mentioned in the very beginning, you know, oh, Johnny Depp, Willy Wonka was mm-hmm. cool and stuff. And it kind of just pictured Gene Wilder. You're picturing Gene time. Wilder, Willy yeah. Wonka? That's really interesting. The whole time, until they give a physical description, quite, you know, very much towards the end that he has chocolate brown hair. And then I remember like the difference in their hair. Um, but they mention his teeth a lot, which are very straight. So that was a big Johnny Depp thing. So, it, but I liked better picturing Gene Wilder because I do feel like he's a more human version of Willy Wonka. Uh, Johnny Depp's Willy Wonka, I've, to me, read is more creepy than anything. Well, he's more of a he's more of an even keeled one, which is why I feel like this is written very heavily towards. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. For me, I thought a strength of the author was not only their clarity of writing, mm-hmm. but also their familiarity with the source material, so much so that while I was reading this, I was starting to remember watching CSI mm-hmm. and seeing this film that I had only seen once, <laughs> but I could I could see in my mind's eye mm-hmm. Johnny Depp's performance through the writing, and I thought that was quite good on the part of the author. Yeah. So yeah. for me, I was like, I, I could see him, you know? I see that. Like, looking back on it, it, it helps lend a lot of humanity to Johnny Depp's role. Cause the, you're right. Like the descriptions are very much of him as the character and, and he and his role. And the manicness is very much of that portrayal of the character, but the humanizing element is super prevalent in the way it wasn't in the film. So the author does a good job of keeping that balance. 
Meanwhile, the plotting, I feel like, kind of falls apart. Mm -hmm. There's this whole other subplot with, um, with Mike TV, where, like, when they're investigating the bombing of the factory, they find an enormous fingerprint, and they're like, but who would this fingerprint belong to? And Greg can provide, well, there was one kid who was stretched into taffy, like, you know, and is, like, 10 feet high or something, <laughs> you know, after the Willy Wonka golden ticket incident. Right, and so I was like, here, here's where we're gonna, we're gonna, where we're going to get into the like Orient Express thing. Right. Like they're all convening on Las Vegas at the same time. This can't be coincidence. You would think, but then also just down to the details. I don't get. Mike TV ends up like mailed in a package to the police department. Why does that even happen? I so don't... I think his the package was supposed to go to his parents. Oh, they, but they intercepted. intercepted it. Right, it was. Yeah mailed to his parents. No, I, that's right. I don't really know escape. why that... Yeah, I guess... There's this whole scene where, like, he tries to escape and they, like, the whole police department has to, like, try to grab him and he's stretching and the Oompa Loompas are helping and they eventually, like, tie his hands beneath the... Like, it's it's totally Looney Tunes. It is, and it's like, okay, sure, he's a 10 or 12 foot taffy man, but he needs air, doesn't he? <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. <He's> so... <laughs> Yeah, the, he's the whole... got flat out superpowers from this Willy Wonka thing. <laughs> he the... doesn't appreciate them at all. <laughs> the weirdest part about it is like they're like there's this whole comic thing where it's like they're talking about it and they're like, oh come on, package, blah blah blah. Like someone didn't. It's not like someone tried to ship a body. And there's a pause from like one of the CSI guys. Like they tried to ship a body, didn't they? So they think it's a dead body. Well, they, they find because the X-ray of it reveals bones. It reveals a skeleton. But how can there and... be a skeleton and if he's taffy. <laughs> I don't know. Or a taffy being. The other thing is that the reason that was ever x-rayed is because it set off a metal detector, which is like... Belt what buckle? metal is in there? Yeah. It, probably something he was wearing in his clothing, but it just wasn't smart. But then they also kind of established well, that he's not smart. Not very good at planning. Yeah. Right. That's yeah, also, like, he bombed it because he... Because he could? Hates Charlie and Wonka. And why would you stop a package from being sent if, if it has metal in it? It's not going on, ba like, carry-on baggage on an airplane. I well, don't know. Were uh, they well, monitoring they that kind of thing because be sure. they were... I don't know. It, it was vague. The plotting gets <laughs> weird. And that extends to the end of the fanfic, which I feel like we can just kind of talk about how it wraps up. Like, right. I couldn't even yeah. try to unravel the exact well, threads that lead to it. It was really weird. Like, so Mike TV admits to the, the bombing. But and he had a partner. Yeah, and he had a partner. But he's like, oh, no, it's not Vera Gasalt, which is what they yeah. you know, assumed. Vera Gasalt, it turns out, is, was a lover of Charlie. Right. Uh, like, they had, you Secret know, affair. They were keeping yeah. it a secret just because, like, Willy Wonka wouldn't approve, I guess. I don't know. Well, because she tried to, like, make an exclusive deal for her, like, nut empire to join with the Wonka chocolate empire. And, and Wonka's basically like, nuts aren't candy. Yeah. Get out of here. Yeah. <laughs> nuts are neither chocolate nor candy. I'm not interested. <laughs> and she's like always been in the public eye because, you and know, she... she's been the heiress to this huge nut operation. And she's always had a temper. Yeah. Which but... makes her an obvious suspect. Yeah. So, but she says, you know, there's the allure of something, you know, forbidden in their relationship, and that's mm -hmm. why she kept it up, which, all right. Do we I ever guess. find out who Mike TV's partner in crime was? Yeah, it was Brenda Lee TV, right? Oh, right, right, right. That's but but Brenda Lee TV was formerly Brenda Lee Beauregard. Beauregard. And Wait, is that the case? Because I thought he despised her. <laughs> um, did I miss something? Uh, no, that's what happened. I think the explanation given as to why... So, the Beauregards... I think... No, the TVs split up. No, yeah, TV does hate her. So, and, right. I thought well, they were unrelated. The son, no, you're the right, it is unrelated. hates her. Yeah, Mike TV. I, yeah, see, it was confusing. Like, I don't know. So, Mike TV's parents split up, is right. what they imply. And Violet Beauregard's mother marries Mike TV's right. dad. So right. that's, um, I don't know if that's Brenda. But, but he yeah. refuses and, and, to and, call and, her by her married name. Right. Yeah. She had an appointment with Charlie after Verica Salt did at the, you know, opening location. And basically it's just like she came in and murdered him because she wants to get back at Willy Wonka. Yeah, so what Mike admits to is the bombing. Right. But not anything else. But not he does have a partner that's not established. Not, there, yeah, like mystery why, partner... 
and it's all happening at the same time. So it's just coincidence. Why? <laughs> right. That's what I read, is that it was just supposed to be a coincidence that he'd done this, but I don't understand why that would be the case. Well, Maybe here, it was Gloop. Here's my other... <laughs> his partner. Here's where I feel like, other than the plotting, I have problems with how this fanfic ends. Because it turns out to be Virga... Uh, sorry, Brenda Lee Beauregard, you know, now Brenda Lee TV, the mother of Violet. And, like, they even call her in to what... Not not to the factory. They they bring Wonka... No, to the factory. Yeah, like, they call her into the factory for some reason. She like, makes an appointment with Willy Wonka. Okay, because they she intended to, like, kill his protege and then bomb his location. And no, then, like, she didn't do that. And kill then his kill protege, him. Then kill him. And this is out of anger over what happened to her daughter. Right. right? Which she's not but, happy about still. But here's the thing. It's like... I feel like it's okay to have these different assumptions about how serious it is to turn somebody into a blueberry and squeeze them when those different assumptions are coming from characters on CSI versus characters from Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Mm -hmm. If the characters on CSI are like, this is bizarre, and, you know, Violet's like, yeah, it's fine. If Mike TV's like, oh yeah, I'm like a, a stretchy man now, but like, that's not, it's not that big a deal, you know? Yeah. Like, because that's the assumption of Charlie. It's like, Violet's mom is the only one taking this as, like, a serious offense mm -hmm. in the entire Charlie and the Chocolate Factory milieu in this fanfic. Right, yes. And that's strange, isn't it? Right. Well, it's part of how I think Charlie and the Chocolate Factory went down, I guess. Though, I guess all the parents kind of took it seriously. But what I will say is that Wonka has a good point, and his point is that he took these kids on a tour. Every time they got in trouble is because they didn't listen to what he said. Now, yeah. admittedly, it was a dangerous environment. I'm right? really confusing my but, movies. Yeah, but he's also standing back being like, no, don't do that. No, you that's, should be, you oh, you that's should be doing that while they're just like doing that. That's a good point. Rather no, than like, a good point. doing what a responsible adult would, would do and like walking up and like, pulling them aside and be yes. like, hey, hey. But you know, turn he's, you into a blueberry. he's clearly not, you know, <laughs> a uh, responsible adult. Exactly. <laughs> but this. At this point, I, I started to wonder, was this fanfic perhaps the victim of being too popular? Hmm. And maybe did this author have the intention of having kind of a murder on the Orient Express ending where they're all getting revenge on Charlie because they were all jealous that he won or and they got, you know, <laughs> screwed or whatever. And instead of wanting to go for the obvious ending the author wanted to go for like some weird twist and just ended up doing this yeah. instead. I don't know. I mean, I would have been more satisfied with the, the right murder mystery. All more the suspects obvious. Gathered in a room sort of yeah. thing as well. I do. Yeah, I do think that the, I mean, what I was going to say earlier on is, um, the author seemed to have a specific delight in trying to bring a CSI plot in and also explore each of the golden ticket winners minus Augustus Gloop as older people and also put them, you know, specifically in a context where they would be investigated in some way by the CSI people so so that we could see them and their lives on display, basically. Mm -hmm. But then it sort of seemed like they had a rush to wrap up, mm -hmm. basically. Because the wrapping up happens here, it's like, Brenda, yeah, it's called the Chocolate Factory. Wonka is the one who realizes what happened. He's like, why did you kill Charlie? And then she starts to shoot at him in and, the candy factory. And the only reason the CSI characters show up is they're tipped off coincidentally mm -hmm. at the same time. Uh -huh. And then rush in to go save yeah. Wonka or whatever. So what was a pretty strong build ends up being like a series of coincidences that don't fully come together. Well, and weird other things happen. She shoots Wonka. And, like, he slows it down, slows down the bullet, with magic, right? Mm -hmm. That's what he does? Mm -hmm. And He, he does, like, a Matrix dodge. <laughs> he, he, well, he didn't need to do that. Because At first. Because after that, he, like, heals the wound with some kind of, like, taffy that's growing in the garden. And, like, mm -hmm. it's like the taffy's kind of, like, holding his blood in place until, like, more medical attention yes. can be provided. And, and also... And that's a Wonka thing to do. Mm -hmm. The magic part is not. And the magic comes back strong in the next part. It's like, obviously Wonka is magic. Obviously, you can't describe this candy as anything other than magic. Mm -hmm. But they have him do, like, actual, like, force of will, I don't know, the will and the word type, like, turning 
he, restoring the candy shop that was bombed at the very end. He and literally like, uses his cane like a wand. It's very difficult <laughs> for him, but he does it. And he's like, mm-hmm. and he, he gets help from Greg because Greg believes in magic. Mm-hmm. But yeah. I didn't like it. And I didn't like it because that's not Wonka magic. No. That's, that's someone saying like, oh, this must be magic. And I have my assumptions about how magic must work from other works of fiction. It's not taking the rules of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and working from there. So like, What I'm trying to say is that clearly Willy Wonka could take a rainbow, wrap it in a sigh, soak it in the sun, and make a groovy lemon pie. But the way he would do it was he would would have all this testing beforehand with a room with prisms, with like rainbows being cast onto things. He would have a separate testing room with a bunch of Oompa Loompas sighing, and like he would be testing the sighs to see what sort of sigh would be most appropriate to wrap the rainbow in. And that's yes. that is how yeah. he operates. Yeah, that's true. He's he, very he precise. Develops things precisely. However, I feel what the author did was extrapolate that there's some sort of magic that he can use innately that yeah. allows him to do these sort of processes in order to create candy because his scientific approach to candy is supported by magic. That's how they did. Yes, I just don't like it. I agree. <laughs> I agree because what I feel is that everything was going very well. Um, Brenda was wrapped up in candy vines from the candy garden. And, and I accept cocooned. that completely, that he yeah, has totally. vines in the candy garden sure. to respond to aggression. Why not? Sure. <laughs> but And then he's shot, you know, in the shoulder, and the taffy comes in, and he uses the taffy to heal. Of course he has taffy that can hold his blood in until, like, right. you know, the bullet can be removed. Sure. That all works. Yes. It's just, yeah, the other pieces, the all of a sudden, especially to bring it just in at the end, Yeah. the bullet dodging and then the mental magic to rebuild, almost kind of incidental, not really important, and yet this is another part that felt rushed, too, because, yeah, at the very end, he has to rebuild his Las Vegas store, and it's Greg's power of belief that supports him. Mm-hmm. However, it is all of this, like, magically, the building was back in one piece, and then they corrected the crooked sign, and it just could have been something a little different. Like, Greg's power of belief he, could have gone it, somewhere it else, was I guess. very Harry Pottery magic at yeah, the end. Yeah. It, it, like, point a wand at, at it and do something and kind it, of magic. It's not, it didn't feel consistent. And you could have done that in a way that I would have accepted from Willy Wonka. Mm-hmm. If it had been less that, I want to repair this store, yes. and more that... All the things that I shipped over for the special store, these are elements that want to be a candy shop. And so we just need to like get them back in shape to, to do the thing that they want to do. Like if if you provide that will to like the elements of the candy store, I would accept that more mm-hmm. than providing that to the will of Willy Wonka. So with a couple of Oompa Loompas to, you know, wash the windows at the end and exactly. like, put a little yeah. sheen on it. <laughs> <laughs> and part of the ending here was that Charlie needed to be replaced in some way and, and Wonka needed to restore his faith. And Greg was the person to do that because Greg from the very beginning of the story followed the mm-hmm. the golden ticket giveaway and had the He loves belief. Wonka. He loves Wonka he, candy. Yes, mm-hmm. he loves the chocolate. So what they wanted to do at the end was have his power of belief be a magical force that Wonka could use. It's just they didn't have to do it like presto magico my building is fixed clap if you believe in fairies yeah that wasn't you're right it wasn't the wonka magic so i i do feel like it was maybe the simplest and easiest way Mm -hmm. to have that resolution happen to have wonka have someone to replace charlie in his life to have the magic be really explicitly done and the power of belief done there but it yeah it I don't know. I don't know another way you could have done it. It just, you're right, it didn't make sense for Wonka magic. And to be fair to the author, I mean, it seemed like it was a pretty popular fan fiction at the time. Is this was true? what I would call medium popular, assuming that I'm not missing anything. Um, on fanfiction.net, it's got 370 faves, 104 follows. Um, it's like people were reading it. Right. And but, so probably but, but people not, were asking. That doesn't mean it was like a, a major hit. But yeah, you're right. Probably you know? people were asking. So the author at some point, I think you said, said that the muse had left and she wasn't really interested in writing it as they much didn't anymore. Say it in those words, it's more like, oh, I had trouble coming up with this next part. Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I have a little bit of sympathy, like feeling like you have to finish something or, or do something in a certain amount of time for other people mm-hmm. 
but um, it's just too bad that that it did kind of peter out with such a strong beginning. Had a lot of promise, but it was still yeah. a fun read. It was still really fun. It was, and <laughs> when the tension is working for the story between the two kind of sets of assumptions, I thought it was really the most entertaining. Yeah. And that's maybe why the ending is a little disappointing because it kind of gets everyone to kind of get on the side of, of, oh, we believe in magic. And it also changes the nature of the magic. So you're just kind of not in that space at all anymore. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I really agree with you, CJ, that that's probably what happened here is the need to wrap it up. And as far as wrapping things up goes, it's not the worst. I do appreciate you pointing out that thematic, like, I I guess I wasn't thinking about that in those terms of like, Willy Wonka, to be clear, does not, like, say, hey, Greg, you're my new number two. But he does gift Greg, like, a tiny bit of his magic. He's like, it just needs a spark to, like, get going. And probably is cheered by finding somebody else, you know, over in mm-hmm. another side of the world who, like, believes in him and what he's doing. That was kind of the character arc. Is um, Though I think they do specifically, some of the CSI people say specifically, like, you know, Wonka's like, I have no apprentice, I have no future. And they're like, oh, we can figure out someone who can help. And then they bring Greg in to meet him for the first time. Mm-hmm. And so it's kind of implied, and they kind of say he has a second job, so it's implied that he's going to be... That is true. Oh, he's supposed to take care of the store in yes. Las Vegas. That's right. Yeah. That as is what he's well going to do. well as work in his current position, which seems like quite a lot since he's already working full time. But <laughs> all right. <laughs> we'll go down to part time. That's where the magic yeah. comes in. I guess so. I mean, he can go on the Willy Wonka salary, but he play, pays exclusively in chocolate. That's <laughs> like what the Oompas get, right? Yeah. So it's not going to sustain him too well. Mm-hmm. Uh, Wonka probably has chocolate that is just a full sustaining meal, though, right? He mm. must. Candy. I mean, I know the, uh, the, the the gum was supposed to provide the flavor of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was, was it the also, flavor, though. Was it also the nutrition? I don't think so. He's had 10 more years to work on it. So yeah. I did watch some clips after this to re-familiarize myself. Uh-huh. And I remember him saying, like, it's supposed to replace three meals a day. Oh. oh. So. Okay. That'd be awesome. Oh, my so God. So yeah. at least then you can cut your oh. food budget. <laughs> oh, my God. No, as long as you work like, the kinks out. <laughs> not having the, the process of, like, Ooh. cooking and the process of eating and all of the work it takes just to, like, sustain your body. Oh, I would love that. Mm-hmm. Well, look, Greg also knows firsthand that turning blue is not actually that big a deal. And you can only turn a different color once, right? And like, it, you can only turn blue once. It'll I give guess. you a promising mm-hmm. career in the Cirque du Soleil. If things Probably. go so, wrong. <laughs> blue is a great color. I would look great as blue. So. He would have his choice between Cirque du Soleil and Blue Man Group. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was about to say that. There you go. <laughs> All right. Anything else that either of you want to talk about in this story that we glossed over? I think we hit the main points. I think we did. I really wish I had a better understanding of the ending of the story. Like, I feel like there's something else I should should say, but I feel like it actually didn't make sense. Is that true? It's like, it it didn't contradict things, Mm -hmm. but it did not hang together cohesively. And so, for example, even the, the idea that Charlie was drowned in chocolate... Yeah, how, what, how did that How happen? did that even happen? Because apparently her style is more to shoot someone, right? Right. Like, And what? The, the shooting does kind of come out of nowhere, too. It's like Wonka's like, I figured this mystery out, which is actually kind of cool because the CSI people couldn't figure it out because it was in his world. But then she starts to shoot at him. I, but I'm not no, even it's clear. never explained. Maybe she discovered that. what happened to the 20 Oompa Loompas who were in that store when Charlie was murdered, or supposed to be around when Charlie was murdered. Like, how could he have been drowned in the chocolate if the chocolate was in the store and yes. the Olympus were in the store? Maybe yeah, because it was sleeping. very... <laughs> All 20. And maybe Brenda discovered that Willy Wonka cannot be killed by chocolate. It's oh, I mean, I believe it. Absolutely impossible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that would make sense, yeah. It's just, yeah, how did he get drowned? Um, why did Mike TV bomb the place around exactly the same time that Charlie was murdered and his stepmom was also setting up Charlie's murder? Like even though he apparently hates his stepmom and would never work with her. Like, this this is confusing. Mm -hmm. Mm. Right? Yeah. Right? There's a lot of confusion that, I mean, but it's not even really worth thinking about, though. It's like, you reach the end, and it's like, oh, like, we have the the suspect, I mean, the the perpetrator, and, you know, it's done. And why leave poor Augustus Gloop out of this? Come on. Now he's he's thin and fit and the head of a 
like protein powder yeah, company. Yeah, like or spokesperson oh, yeah. for a protein powder <laughs> right. company in Europe. It's true. That is kind of a snub. If yeah. you're bringing back all the golden ticket winners except one, mm-hmm. it's yeah. like you might as well just bring back all of them. They mention him. They just don't do anything with him. But, you know, to be fair, they don't do much with Mike TV in the sense of, like, they make him a suspect and he gets to, like, jump around after being released from a box. Well, that's as much as they do with either of the other two. Like, Violet has one scene. Mm-hmm. You know, Vera Salt has two scenes, but they're short. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, none of them are on for very long, but they're all around. But what I see with Veruca and Violet is that they're portrayed as, like, attractive women. Like, especially uh, yeah. when, mm-hmm. I don't know, whichever guy who's talks about porn a lot goes to see it's greg uh same greg, greg. It's okay, all greg. Yeah, yeah that guy <laughs> whatever the young one. Oh yeah the one that looks like uh tony hawk yes uh he goes to see her and he's like uh, constantly like holding himself back because the way she can contort herself is apparently sexy even though it's really weird and inhuman <laughs> and she's blue but okay whatever, i find greg. it rather off-putting but yeah fine okay. whatever um and then the whole thing with veruca is she is like attractive and rich and blonde and had a thing with charlie and so there i i don't know it seems like the author had this thing with making the the women like is sexual and that was appealing and maybe that's in the tone with csi i don't know i don't know but and then mike tv was sort of novel but because oh, okay. augustus gloop didn't go undergo any transformations either uh, but look, it, it's not know. hard. Have Augustus Gloop be actually like a close friend of Charlie's. Mm-hmm. Have them call him to like try to follow up on information on a lead about one of the other uh, golden ticket holders or to, to check in about Charlie's relationship with the other golden ticket holders. So also, he can have one scene. He doesn't have to be physically present in Las Vegas. He gets to be present in the story. Done. Or tie his... his- uh, powder expertise to gunpowder, and there you go. <laughs> His protein powder is also gunpowder. Though to be fair, Augustus Blue yeah. is the first one to fall subject to like his. Uh, his sins yeah. in the movie. Mm-hmm. So he doesn't have a big role in the film. He falls in the river and it's like, bye, bye dude. But they could have made him appear for just the same amount right. of time. Mm-hmm. So. I, I just. I just like these things to be tidy. I feel like last week Mm -hmm. I was also complaining, even in A Night in the Lonesome October, which we love, I was like, but it's not all, it doesn't all fit just so like my mind wants it to. Mm -hmm. I agree, because the thing is, you either have to look at it as the plot making sense or the author's motivation here making sense. And if the author's motivation is to show all of the Charlie and Chocolate Factory characters in a CSI scene, leaving one out, really messes with that yeah Yeah. but maybe the author intended to put him in and just ran out of time like it seems like they probably ran out of time to do the ending here i don't know and it's also just one of those things where when you're writing serialized stuff serially sometimes things get lost in the shuffle and like right don't want to give the author too much flack since they were writing as they went Mm mm-hmm I know this is a good story. Like, let's not get too bogged down in our, our mental hangups, well, we, I guess. We've kind of de facto done our complaining session here, yes. probably. Yeah. So why don't we end on wrapping back around to praise? Well, other than a few kind of awkward phrasing in some places, for the most part, I think this was a really strong writer. Yeah. Very snappy. The dialogue's um, good. Dialogue's really good. Very believable. Uh, the characters are really well drawn. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, I enjoyed reading it. You know, I went through and you know I laughed and you laughed, the, you cried, I cried yeah. <laughs> kind of inside. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was just it was really well written in that way. So. Mm-hmm. I completely agree with that. Like the characterization was really on point, especially aging up some of these characters to their new ages and like accounting for the fact that they've changed as people giving reasons why but still having them kind of stay a little bit true to where they started and furthermore it was just like i mentioned at the beginning a story i never thought would be possible like i thought this would be corny as heck it wouldn't make sense like but as something you mentioned amato the tension between the absurdism Mm -hmm. of you know Roald Dahl's work and csi you know, in its own way absurd, but actually, you know, trying to be real, created the author identified the tension and they use that humorously to their advantage. Mm-hmm. Like the CSI characters being like, I don't believe this is happening. 
you're pulling my leg, this is insane, and eventually having to believe it was like a really good tension for the story. And probably the only place you could have gone with such an absurd mashup of stories, or um, media, I mean, that was really fun. I really like this kind of crossover. Um, I mean, like, thinking thinking back to what some of our early stories, like the Gargoyles Ghostbusters one, right? There were certain pleasures to be had in that, but you can just drop them in the same world with the same assumptions and they're fine. Mm-hmm. And that's like one kind of crossover, right? And this is more like watching Muppet Christmas Carol, right? Mm-hmm. Where you've got the pleasure is in seeing these two very, very different elements trying to synergize, or if not synergize, at least both using their own means of propelling the story forward. Yeah. Or just and like bouncing off of each, each other. Bouncing off yeah. each other, complementing each other, whatever. There is... And I feel like that's a harder kind of crossover to conceive of and a harder kind of crossover to write. And so I think I see a lot more fanfics where it's just not that hard to mix them. Well, fanfic crossovers, I mean, where it's not hard to mix the elements. Mm-hmm. And so it's, it's really cool to see a well-done shot at something like this. It's a very ambitious project that I think they pulled off overall pretty well. Definitely. Ambitious is a good word. There's something uniquely delightful in seeing that (laughs) sort of synergy, you know? It's like, wow, they did it. (laughs) Have we done any other fanfics, fanfic crossovers like that? Um, no, like, Evangelion Lovecraft, like, it's not a well, problem, you we know? We did the, um, <laughs> Star Trek Sailor Moon. <laughs> Star Trek Sailor Moon, though. I remember you saying that made sense to you, and it did not make sense <laughs> to me. So that's all I have to say. Okay, fair enough. And what other crossovers have we done? Muppets, Ronmo one half? It's not, not as much of a stretch. I mean, it is. Uh, because they're very, very different. But they're both comedy. Formats, I but feel both like comedy. this, yeah, this is right. a stretch in tone between the two, for sure. All right. Well, thank you very much for coming on, CJ. It was a pleasure to be here. Yes, thank you, CJ. Next week, we're turning to a different guest. I believe we will have Tori's brother, Chris, back on, who's come on a couple of times as a pinch hitter, to talk about a Final Fantasy VII fanfic. We'll be reading the first two stories in... The Final Fantasy VII Internet Series. That is what it's called. The series of stories. The Final Fantasy Internet Series. The Final Fantasy VII Internet Series. Ah. Yes. It was that early in the life of the fandom, apparently, that you could just call it that. And it could be the one. It could be the thing that people read. So it was fairly well known in the burgeoning fandom back in the day, I believe. You can find a link to that at bit.ly slash rfr series. You know... I'm going for the key word there. Not final, not fantasy, not even internet, just series. I feel like you're going to run into some problems with that later. I don't think I am, because there's always another word, you know? It's not going to be just the series. It's not going to be a story called series. I'll Fair go enough. for the low-hanging fruit this time, and then later on, <laughs> you know, it can be some other word in a something series. Yeah, well, I'll see how that works for you. I will. I will do that. As for this, this was episode 58 of Retro Fanfic Retrospective, CSI Death by Chocolate, a CSI Charlie and the Chocolate Factory crossover by Beth Einspanier, Einspanier, Beth E. (laughs) (laughs) Beth E-I-N-S-P-I-E-N-E-R, I I don't know. That's what I do these days as a substitute teacher when I run to somebody's name that I don't know how to say it. I'm just say like, um, you know, E-I-N-S, how do I say this? And, like, hope yeah, someone jumps in. Well, because, I mean, you know, kids get so offended if you mispronounce their names. I mean, people mispronounce my name all the time. Yeah, but you don't learn that grace until you're older. Right, yeah, no, I know. I just mean it was annoying. Mm-hmm. <laughs> people almost always wanted to say Amando, reading it off of, like, a list there's of names in school. There's no N I know there. there's no N. Yeah, but people want there to be an N. I, all right. <laughs> Well, Occasionally, I remember at one time being awarded for some sort of, I don't know, dare thing, like the anti-drug program, I don't know. It was a... Anyway, the person definitely called out Armando. They added an R and an N to the name. Why would they do that? Because their mind thought that there should be that one's there, you know? When you look at a word, you just look at the first and last letter. Yeah, so mm-hmm. yeah. 
in their mind, I'm sure that that's what an A it. ending in an O male name like a would Latin be. Name. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, that's fair. But I, that's still not actually Armando is still not actually a name. By the way, <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> you just offended all of our listeners named Armando. Okay, I, I'm somebody out there named Armando. I'm so sorry, but it's not a name I'm familiar with. Armando is absolutely a name. Mm-hmm. No, it is. I've I've seen it before. A R A R M A N D O. Armando I'm it given up name right now. Wikipedia says it is a variant of the name Herman. It is a name. Yep. Okay. Well, I was wrong. Sorry. It's just not my name. Yeah, it's not your name. It's not a name. Take I'm heed, listeners. <laughs> <laughs> I messed up. Anyway, the point is, I'm sorry, author of this fanfic. I, I don't know how to say your last name. And I was not able to get in touch with them. I sent them a fanfiction.net message, but didn't get a response. Could be they're no longer active since their last fanfic that went up was a couple years ago. March 2017. If they ever go back on, they'll be surprised. Surprised, I'm sure. Well, they kind of have a broad range of fanfic topics. Alice in Wonderland, Discworld, Portal... The Avengers, nice. Dresden Files, Half Life, Metroid and Half Life, Naruto. Yeesh! I don't. I'd watch it. I'd, I feel uh, like I'd, uh, it's unusual to see this much range. Sherlock Holmes crossovers. I just wanted to about let it, I guess. you know what they. Um, I looked up Armando to make sure it was a name, but then I looked up it's Amato. A and Amato I, might not be a name. The Urban Dictionary definition of Amato. Mm-hmm. Amato is a true N-word that doesn't let his friends down. He is an amazing person and gets lots of girls. He is also the type of person that loves his life. Usually, Amatos have black hair and likes to wear sweatshirts. Hmm. Just so you know. I wore more sweatshirts when I was younger. (laughs) (laughs) I just love it that anytime you look up someone's name on Urban Dictionary, it's like someone promoting their own name Mm -hmm. as like a good person. (laughs) That's why Urban Dictionary is... Kind of a useless resource. It's amazing. <laughs> Add a citation needed to that one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to look up my name. Well, we'll come back to that. Okay. Anyway, that was episode 58 of Retro Fanfic Retrospective, as I said. The intro song for the podcast is The Weekly Fair off of the album Popey's Incredible Adventure by Komiku. The outro song is Run Against the Universe from the same album. You can find this album and other works by Komiku, by Komiku at loyaltyfreakmusic.com. You can find our website at retrofanficretrospective.podbean.com or bit.ly slash retrofanfic. We have tags, you know, for like the different topics of episodes. We're going to have to add a new tag that we will never ever use again for CSI Las Vegas. Those tags are just going to keep on expanding. Do we need to use one for Charlie the Chocolate Factory too? I guess we do. Mm. I mean, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Then people can just browse the tags on the right and be like, whoa, they did a Charlie and the Chocolate Factory fanfic? I want to listen to that episode. And then they'll be deeply disappointed. So, you know, that's or what it's delighted. for. Yeah. Or delighted. Yeah. Or delighted. I was delighted. <laughs> I just have to say. Um, okay. I mean, I, I guess you could be a Charlie and the Chocolate Factory fan who definitely wants to hear about a story where Charlie is dead on page one and, you know, tragedy and horror. I don't judge or it, much. It, it could be wanting to hear about the characters when they're older and Willy Wonka is a and human. <laughs> it's so hard. So and hard. some of them are running protein powder empires across the sea. And yeah, but they don't show up. Yeah, they, <laughs> they don't, don't appear. <laughs> if you have questions, comments, or thoughts about the episode, please contact us on Twitter at RetroFanfic or Facebook at RetroFanfic on Reddit at Fanfic Retrospective. Send us an email at retrofanficretrospective at gmail.com. Leave comments or reviews on Apple Podcasts or the podcast service of your choice. Or ideally, do like all five or six of those things. Just contact us everywhere. Flood us. Send the same message a million ways to make sure we see it. Actually, don't do that. I I mean, whatever. No, don't do that. You're right. (laughs) I'm Amato. I'm Tori. (laughs) I'm CJ. We're just three Earth life forms trying to be nice to each other. Until next time, take care. Does anyone else feel like that ending was a little stilted?
Let's does anybody need anything before we start? Probably not. Food, water, dog treat. I just need fan fiction to sustain me, but thanks. Okay. <laughs> well, I knew that, Amato. It's, <laughs> it's just more of a courtesy. It all Correct. makes sense now.